The focus of this video will be to understand the Kubernetes objects and how they are represented in the Kubernetes API. We will first understand what are objects and how they are represented in Kubernetes. We will understand a simple pod and how it is created within a cluster. Under object management, we will go through the different ways to create and manage Kubernetes objects. We will then go through the concept of objects names. And finally, we will learn about namespaces in a Kubernetes cluster. Kubernetes objects are persistent entities in the Kubernetes system and can be expressed in YAML format. YAML stands for YAML Int Markup Language and is basically a human readable structured data format. It is less complex than XML or JSON, but provides similar capabilities. These objects, or we can say entities, represent the state of the cluster. By creating an object, we are essentially telling the desired state to the cluster. Then, as we know, the controllers in the cluster will work to ensure that the actual state meets the desired state. Objects describe the following in the perspective of Kubernetes cluster. What containerized applications are running in the cluster and on which nodes they are running, the resources made available to these applications, and the policies around how those applications behave, such as restart policies, upgrades, and fault tolerance. As we learned earlier, to work with Kubernetes objects, that is whether to create, modify, or delete them, we need to use the Kubernetes APIs. The command line utility kubectl makes the necessary Kubernetes API calls when commands are issued using it. Instead, we can also use the Kubernetes API directly in our programs using one of the client libraries. Objects spec and status. The Kubernetes objects includes two nested fields for an object, the object spec and the object status. The object spec is provided by the user and describes the desired state for the object in a YAML format. The object status, on the other hand, describes the actual state of the object in the Kubernetes cluster. For example, a Kubernetes deployment is an object that represents an application running on the cluster. When we create the deployment, the spec specifies the number of replicas of the application that we want to be running. On the basis of the deployment spec, three instances of the application are created which matches the spec. If any of those instances crashes, the controllers respond to the difference between spec and status by starting a replacement instance. Let's understand the smallest deployable object in the Kubernetes object model, which is a pod. A pod encapsulates the following, single or multiple containers. Generally, there is just one container in a pod, but there can be multiple containers as well within a single pod. Some pods have init containers and app containers. Init containers run and complete before the application containers are started. Storage resources, they provide the storage for the container. A pod can specify a set of shared storage volumes. All containers in the pod can access the shared volumes, allowing those containers to share data. Volumes also allow persistent data in a pod to survive in case one of the containers within the pod needs to be restarted. Basically, the containers share the storage resources together as a single manageable entity. A unique network IP, each pod is assigned a unique IP address. Every container in a pod shares the network namespace, including the IP address and the network ports. Containers inside a pod can communicate with one another using localhost. And when containers in a pod communicate with entities outside the pod, they must coordinate how they use the shared network resources, such as ports. In addition to the above, we can also specify options that govern how the containers should run. For example, the command that needs to be executed on the container once it is spun. Pods are designed as ephemeral and disposable entities. They do not self-heal. If a node running a pod fails, or if the scheduling of the pod itself fails, then the pod is deleted. Similarly, a pod won't survive an eviction due to lack of resources or node maintenance. As we learned in one of the previous videos, Kubernetes uses controllers, example deployment controllers, replication controllers, daemon sets, etc. to implement pod scaling and healing. A controller can create and manage multiple pods for you, handle replication and rollout, and provide self-healing capabilities at cluster scope. For example, if a node fails, the controller might automatically replace the pod 
by scheduling an identical replacement on a different node. Pod manifest or template? Let's take a look at a simple pod template or pod manifest. The same is used as a template within the controllers when pod is run along with the controllers. First we specify the API version which is v1 for the pod, the kind of the Kubernetes object which is pod in this case. Under metadata we have mentioned the name for this object, we will cover name in just a moment. And under spec we have mentioned the container details. All the containers specifications running within a pod are mentioned under spec. Here we have given a name to the container. The container is supposed to run Ubuntu latest image and once it is up, it will run the command to echo hello Kubernetes and then sleep for a minute. Post that, it will automatically terminate. Restart policy as never means that the pod will not be automatically restarted by the Kubernetes cluster. As we can see, the pod is in running state now. Under the logs, we can verify the echo message that we had specified. And after a minute, the pod should terminate. And now we can see that the pod has completed. Let's understand the different phases a pod could be in. The phase of a pod is a simple, high-level summary of where the pod is in its life cycle. Here are the possible values for phase. First is pending. It means that the pod has been accepted by the Kubernetes system, but one or more of the container images have not been created. Pods might be in waiting to be scheduled or downloading the images for the container. Running. The pod has been bound to a node and all of the containers have been created. At least one container is still running or is in the process of starting or restarting. Succeeded or completed. All containers in the pod have terminated in success and will not be restarted. Next is failed. All containers in the pod have terminated and at least one container has terminated in failure. That is, the container either exited with non-zero status or was terminated by the system. And last is unknown. For some reason, the state of the pod could not be obtained, typically due to an error in communicating with the host of the pod. Container states. The information reported as pod status depends on the current container state. So let's talk about it. Once a pod is assigned to a node by the scheduler, Kubelet starts creating containers using the container runtime. There are three possible states of containers, waiting, running and terminated. To check the state of the container, we can use kubectl describe pod command. Let's check it for the pod which we had run earlier. State is displayed for each container within the pod. We can see that the state of this container is terminated with reason as completed. Let me rerun the pod. And now we can see that the container is running as we had provided a sleep of one minute before termination. Let's come back to the container states. Waiting is the default state of container. If container is not in either running or terminated state, it is in waiting state. A container in waiting state still runs its required operations like pulling images, applying secrets, etc. Running, it indicates that the container is executing without issues and terminated indicates that the container completed its execution and has stopped running. A container enters into this state when it has successfully completed execution or when it has failed for some reason. Termination of pods. The pod in our example terminates automatically when the job is done. Its job was to echo the statement and then wait for a minute. Then it got terminated by itself. Pods which have running processes and are no longer required needs to be terminated. When a user requests deletion of a pod, the system records the intended grace period before the pod is allowed to be forcefully killed and a termination signal is sent to the main process in each container. When in the grace period, the pod is shown as terminating and the kubelet begins the pod shutdown process. Once the grace period has expired, the kill signal is sent to those processes 
and the pod is then deleted from the API server. By default, all deletes are graceful within 30 seconds. The kubectl delete command, which is used for deleting the pods, supports the grace period equal to seconds option, which allows a user to override the default and specify their own value. The value of grace period as zero force deletes the pod. Forceful deletion of a pod immediately deletes the pod from the cluster state and the etcd. The API server does not wait for confirmation from the kubelet that the pod has been terminated on the node it was running on. It removes the pod in the API immediately, so a new pod can be created with the same name. The actual pod is still given a small grace period before being forcefully killed. For more details check the link in the description. Learn with Wits Labs. Success Certified.